All right, welcome back to the effect. Uh, we are still talking about instrumental variables. And in particular, we're talking about how do we estimate instrumental variables estimates. Uh, we have this concept of instrumental variables as a research design where we have a source of exogenous variation and we can use that to narrow down our look just at the data that is randomly assigned and then see what is the effect within that data uh, and hopefully that's going to give us the causal effect of interest. But how do we actually perform that estimation once we have our instrument? So let's start with the sort of conceptually easiest way of inst estimating instrumental variables, at least I think, which is two-stage least squares. It's also probably the most common way of estimating instrumental variables. The way that two-stage least squares works is you have two different regression equations. The first one, uh, you are using your instrument and whatever control variables you have to predict your treatment. And then you are using just the predicted part of the treatment to predict your outcome. It is a very literal interpretation of what instrumental variables does. You are, like I said in the first video on instrumental variables, just isolating the part of the treatment that is predicted by the instrument, as opposed to seeing what you can predict and subtracting it out as you would with a control variable. Let's see how this works. As I said, we have two different equations. The first one, we are using our instrument and whatever other control variables we have. Uh, our instrument here is Z, our control variables are W, and we are predicting with a regression our treatment X. We're going to run that regression. We're going to get our predicted values. That Those predicted values are only the part of X that is predicted by the instrument and the controls. That means that it is our exogenous variation that we have. We can then take that predicted value and plug it into our second stage where we are replacing X that we normally had. We would normally regress Y on X and W, but here we're regressing Y on the predicted values for X and W. Uh, and from this, we are using only the part of X that is predicted by the exogenous variation and therefore is the randomized part of X and therefore, when we estimate this model, we know that there's going to be no more emitted variable bias uh, because we have used only the part of X that only has random variation in it. And in random variation, there can't be anything related to the error term. We're good to go. And so the coefficient beta 1 on our X hat variable is going to give us the two stage least squares estimate of our effect of X on Y. Uh, now, there is a bit of more detail to this estimation procedure. We do need to make some adjustments to our standard errors to account for the fact that we estimated what our x hat was. It wasn't an actual value in the data. But this is the basic idea behind two-stage least squares. Now, I do want to be clear. Two-stage least squares is just one way of estimating an instrumental variables model. Uh, it is not the same thing as instrumental variables. That's an easy thing to get confused. In fact, you'll see some people talking about those two as though they're the same, when in fact they're not. In fact, let's talk about a different way of estimating instrumental variables as well, which is the generalized method of moments. Uh, what the generalized method of moments is, is it says we're going to take some calculations from our data and say, here's what they should be equal to, and I'm going to choose my coefficients such that those two things are equal. If that's a bit difficult to follow, maybe go ahead and read the chapter. But the basic idea is this. We are basing our instrumental variables estimation on an assumption, and that assumption is uh, that our instrumental variable is unrelated to the error term in that second stage equation. If you look back at our two-stage least squares equation, where we're regressing y on x and our control variables, and we have an error term epsilon, we are assuming that our instrument is unrelated to that error term, right? If we were just doing regular ordinary least squares, we would say we're going to assume that our x is unrelated to the error term, but in instrumental variables, we're assuming that our instrument, z, is unrelated to the error term. So we're going to take that assumption that z is unrelated to the error term, and we're going to build a set of moment conditions out of it. We're going to say that, hey, your instrument should be uncorrelated uh, with our residuals, more or less, and then we're going to choose our coefficients such that that is true. And in doing so, you get a different way of getting at the same kind of idea. And in fact, you can do generalized method of moments for even just regular uh, linear regression without instrumental variables in it at all. In fact, the estimates work out almost, ex almost exactly the same for generalized method of moments and two-stage least squares. Uh, there are two benefits to using generalized method of moments. One is that it performs a lot better when you have heteroscedasticity in your model. Uh, the generalized method of moments is just simply better at handling heteroscedasticity. It will give you a smaller standard error, and it will give you a more accurate standard error as well. The other place in which generalized method of moments differs from two stage least squares is if you have multiple instruments, you can actually have more than one instrument in your instrumental variables model. Nothing stopping you from using multiple sources of exogenous variation to predict your treatment. And in that case, generalized method of moments tends to do it a little bit better as well. So we have multiple different ways of estimating our instrumental variables estimate. There's in fact more than these. There's limited information, maximum likelihood, there's other stuff. Uh, but uh, my point is that there are multiple different ways to get at this same idea. Now, when you do this estimation, you also want to think about what kind of treatment effect you are actually estimate. And for this, I think it's easiest to go back to uh, the two-stage least squares estimate. What do I mean by the kind of estimate that you are estimating? Well, I mean the kind of treatment effect that you are getting. 
Uh, in this case, we are using only the variation in x that is predicted by the instrument. And a similar thing applies when we're looking at the generalized method of moments. Now, because we are focusing just in the part of the treatment that is predicted by our instrument, that means that we are only using people for whom the instrument does a good job predicting their treatment. So in other words, let's say it's the kind of treatment that doesn't really have an effect on you. Well, then, you know, you don't really count so much in the instrumental variables estimate. So going back to our randomized control trial for a drug, for example, let's say that you are just really suspicious of medicine and you're not going to take that drug no matter whether you get assigned to it or not. Then whatever effect the drug would have had on you, you don't count in my estimate. You simply drop out. You're what's called a never taker. You never would take the treatment no matter what I assign you to. Uh, similarly, if you're the kind of person who's going to find a way to take that drug no matter what, again, you don't count. Uh, the instrumental variables estimate will only reflect the effect for people who don't take it when they're not assigned by the instrument and do take it when they are assigned. And even beyond that, the stronger of a response you have, the more you are going to count. So let's say, for example, that I have a randomized controlled trial. Let's stick with that, uh, where I'm randomizing to tell you, hey, you should exercise more. And these people, I don't tell them anything at all. Well, how effective is that sort of finger wagging to say that you should exercise more? Maybe one person exercises one more hour a week because I finger wagged at them and told them to exercise more. And a different person is really responsive and they exercise five more hours a week. Well, however effective exercise is for them, uh, I'm going to get a lot more of the effect for the five hour person than for the one hour person. This is what's called a local average treatment effect. I'm getting the average effect, but it's st more strongly weighted by people who are more responsive to the instrument. You pay more attention to the instrument, you respond more strongly, then your treatment effect is going to count for more. So we're not really going to get the effect among people who don't respond to the instrument that much. Like I said, we are isolating just the part of the variation where we are randomly assigned, which is just the part of the variation where the instrument is doing the work of assigning treatment for us. If you are not in the realm of people who respond to that instrument, then your treatment is not randomly assigned, and now is it? Which means that we are not counting you. Uh, which does mean that we are getting an estimate that is more reflective of people who are responsive to whatever the instrument is. And also means that we might get different effects depending on which kind of instrument we have. Let's say that one of my treatments for exercise is finger wagging, saying, hey, you exercise more. Maybe some people are really responsive to that, and some people are less responsive. And over here, we have a different treatment that uh, says, I'm just going to show you a picture of a really physically fit person. Uh, and some people are going to respond really well to that, and some people are not. If those are different people, then I'm going to be picking up the effect of exercise on their health or whatever differently in those two different instrumental cases. So with that all said, what do we have? We have, I've mentioned two different ways of estimating instrumental variables, two stage least squares where we estimate our treatment using our instrument and our controls, and then use that predicted value as a way of predicting our outcome uh, that isolates just the random part of our treatment. And therefore we are getting the effect of treatment on outcome as though the treatment were randomized. We also have generalized method of moments, which is a different way of calculating to get to the similar idea that works better when you have heteroscedasticity uh, and also when you have multiple instruments going on. When we're doing two-stage least squares in particular, we are isolating variation uh, that is driven by the instrument, which means that if your variation in treatment is not driven by the instrument, if you don't care about the instrument, then you don't count in my estimate. If the treatment would have been really effective for you, if exercise would have made you a lot healthier, but you don't respond to the instrument, then I'm not going to see that for you. I'm going to get the effect for people who do respond to the treatment. And so if exercise is less important for them, if it doesn't affect their health as much, I'm going to get a lower effect of exercise. Let's see all of this in action. We're going to look at a study by Kai, Dejanvri, and Sadelet, apologies if I mispronounced any of that, uh, where they did a randomized experiment. They went to rural China uh, and they were trying to sell insurance to farmers. Basically, they were trying to get farmers to look into insurance on their farm. So basically, if you have a really bad year, do you have some insurance that helps you carry through and not have to like sell the farm uh, before you get to the next year? And so what they were interested in is randomizing people to different sort of in informational settings uh, where let's say that in one setting, we're like, we're going to assume that you're going to buy this insurance um, and you have to uh, sort of opt out in a different setting where you have to be sort of opted in. Now, what they were interested in was not so much the effect of uh, whatever class you were in, but they really wanted to look at network effects. They wanted to know if your friend, if your neighbor was randomized into a setting where they were going to be more likely to purchase insurance, does that make you, the neighbor, more likely to purchase insurance as well? You know, you meet up at the fence one day and they're like, hey, I just bought this insurance. And you're like, oh, insurance, that sounds pretty good. Maybe I'll buy some too, right? They're looking for that effect. So they did a bunch of analyses. What we're going to look at is whether your neighbor was randomly assigned into the default buy uh, version of the informational intervention, but it's sort of a harder push. It's sort of assumed that you're going to buy by the end of it. It was a lot more effective at selling insurance to your neighbors. So we're going to look at a form of random assignment of whether your friend was randomized into this sort of higher pressure sales environment. Uh, and then we're going to see how that affects whether your friend buys insurance. Then, then that, that's the treatment. We're going to see whether your friend buying insurance makes you more likely to buy insurance. We're interested in that sort of network effect. 
So here is the regression result that we got using two stage least squares. You can see over there on the left, the first stage. The first stage is using the instrument and all the controls to predict the treatment. And we can see that your friend being randomly assigned into the sort of more high pressure, assume you buy environment, increased their probability of buying the insurance by 11.8 percentage points. So it did have an effect. There was a relevance to this instrument. Being randomly assigned to this setting did indeed make you more likely to buy insurance, your friend more likely to buy insurance, and it was a large effect so that we actually now have some variation to look at. Then we can look at the second stage. We take the predicted part of the in, your friend's insurance buying behavior. We say, okay, based on where you were randomly assigned, what would I predict about how likely you are to buy insurance? And I'll use that prediction to now predict my chances of buying insurance. Uh, and I find that my friend buying insurance makes me much more likely to buy insurance. If my friend buys insurance as opposed to not buying insurance, it makes me 79.1 percentage points more likely to buy insurance, which is a very strong network effect. So randomly assigning one person into a setting where they're more likely to buy insurance is going to have a lot of carryover potential on getting their friends to purchase insurance as well, uh, which might make their farming operations a little bit safer from year to year, although it also means more money for the insurance company, make it whatever all that as you will. All right, so that is how we can estimate an instrumental variables estimate uh, using two stage least squares or generalized method of moments, among a couple of other options which you could read about in the paper as well. We also looked at an example uh, where we saw a randomized uh, instrument, right? In this case, a literal randomization, which is always nice for an instrument. And then we looked at the effect of that on our treatment. And then we looked at the effect of our randomized portion of our treatment on the outcome that we were actually interested in, which is whether the neighbor buys insurance. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.